Good afternoon, guys. It's Sunday, September 5th. My name is Dave Coker, and this is Talking About Finance. Now, you know the routine by now. A bunch of slides that me and my buddies are talking about, a bunch of investment bankers. Uh, I think about 50-50. Uh, 50% of, our, of us are X, and the other 50% still working. And some of these guys I've known, oh, God, 40 years, because <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> But it's okay. And then there's some some younger people that have gotten involved on it as well. So, And I just try to bring the best to you so you can sort of see what's going on in the markets. So once again, guys, we're going to open with the S&P 500 for the past week and sort of a mixed performance. You can see some of the, the uh, tech stocks, Facebook, Google, Amazon, oh, Microsoft, Apple, they, they did fairly well. But if you look at the financials, we saw sort of a burn off over there. There was definitely some, some issues in that part. We had a strong end to August. But something to keep in mind, guys, is this. The S&P 500 is up about 21% year to date. It's really amazing, that type of, of return. As you likely know, the long-run average return of the S&P 500 is roughly 7% or so. And this is since the end of World War II. So it's abnormal to have a, 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 such a sharp return or such a high return, I should say, over the course of the year. And especially because this will be the third year in a row if we do close at these highs where we've had double digit returns. So it's, it's interesting. It's almost as though stocks are in their own world and they're ignoring all sorts of news that, that in other times might have caused investors to reconsider. So in this alternate reality that we've got now in the markets, uh, we're just seeing record high after record high. Fortunately, the VIX is well behaved, the volatility index, also known as the fear index, uh, finished last week below 17, which is below its long run mean. So I don't know. You know, I've, Got dividend money as I shared with you guys. I invest only for dividends. So every month I get a good chunk of money. And for the longest time, I was using that money to acquire additional positions. And hey, dividend paying stocks. <laughs> sort of like compounding, right? But I stopped that about a month ago. I'm not doing that anymore. I've got some interests here with property and I'm bringing the money over here because I think it's a better alternative. So I'm sort of done buying stocks for the time being. Um, if there's a sharp correction, I certainly could be uh, lured back into the market. I could do that. But we'd have to see what happens. This, On some levels, the market's overvalued. On other metrics, it's you know fairly valued. Some people keep tossing the word bubble around, and it's entirely possible that we're in a bubble right now. You never really know until retrospect, until you look back. Here's something from some of my research, guys. And you can tell whenever I present something that I've made in the lower right-hand corner or left-hand corner, someplace down there, it'll have coker.me, which of course is my, my portal with all my work there. And we saw the, the clean energy bubble burst. This was really wild. Uh, the you know sector bubbles burst, but the S&P 500 just keeps pushing on. Now, what we're doing here, ECO is the Wilder Hill Index and it tracks the clean energy sector. So what we're doing is we're looking at, in that index, we're looking at companies that may benefit from a transformation to clean energy and decarbonization. And it did really well. If I baselined, it went back two years, baselined both of them at zero. And you can see ECO surged up 340% at one point. Now it dropped and it's running about 180, 179.83. It's a still very respectable return. But the thing that I'd like to point out to you guys is look at the S&P 500. It's just crunching, 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 running higher, higher, higher. And we'll have to see how long this can continue. I'm not totally sure. This, more for sure, it's an alternate reality. It just is really, really wild. And stocks are ignoring things that happen in the real world. And here, this is particularly interesting. This is JP Morgan's Global Manufacturing Index. And you can read up on the composition. They're tracking manufacturing activity globally across, I can't remember the exact number of companies, but it doesn't really matter. What we're looking at here is we're seeing it starting to drop. Not a significant drop, but then again, considering all the money sloshing around, considering the way the stock market's performing, uh, you would not expect to see this dropping. You'd expect to see it rising. It's really interesting because, again, it's going to impact stocks at some point. And when it impacts stocks, it, it could be severe if this slowdown really continues. Now, on Wall Street, we've got lots of expressions, and I was uh, fortunate enough to work on Wall Street. Started my career, as, as you guys know, um, in 1987, and left to come to Europe about 10 years later. But regardless, I worked on Wall Street when there were a lot of, for want of a better phrase, characters about. <laughs> 
And uh, these guys were incredibly entertaining to a younger guy like me. And they lots of expressions. And one that we, we have on Wall Street, uh, we're talking about stocks and prices going high and things like that. If it goes up like a rocket, it can come down like a brick. And yeah, yeah, this is coming down like a brick. This is space. It's uh, Branson's operation. And remember, they, they had that test flight. And what happened was, apparently, it just came out, and it was really wild. The impact on the stock was severe. It was interesting, though, because apparently a bunch of warning lights went off in the cockpit when the rocket was coming down, and they veered off course. Now, that's pretty severe for rockets. Planes, not so bad. But rockets, they get a little concerned because, well, hey, it's a rocket. (laughs) And they want to make sure if it's coming down, it doesn't come down in in a populated area. And also, they want to make sure that it's not veering into uh, flight paths for, for planes. So they, they're grounded Branson's rocket until they investigate and find out exactly what happened. Lots of articles about, give them a read. It turns out, and this has all come out, it turns out that uh, warning lights and un, un, malperformance or bad performance of the rocket is nothing new for Branson's program, at least. I'm not sure about, about the other two contenders, but it's, it's wild to think that these warning lights are going off and they're still flying. <laughs> and I don't know if NASA ever did that. I, I, I don't think so. I think they, everything had to be perfect for NASA to fly. But, you know, it's, it's interesting that we're getting this performance. So, yeah, it came down like a brick. And one thing to think about, guys, why are stocks in general just going up? Why is there so much interest? Well, there is the acronym TINA. There is no alternative. What are you going to put? Where are you going to put your money? I mean, my God. Uh, of course, the 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 other sector or the other use of capital that we always had since time immemorial was was bonds, debt. So if you didn't like stocks, you could buy treasuries. And in the good old days, you know, even before the global financial crisis, you could pick up six seven percent return on treasuries. Look at this stuff, guys. Treasuries are at negative negative yields. Now it really doesn't pay you to, to to own treasuries. In fact, you're going to be paying for treasuries, to, to put money in treasuries. The yields are ridiculously low. And when you adjust them for inflation, when you look at real yields, they're negative. And the Fed statement after Jackson Hole didn't really help. I've got it here in front of me. Read the whole thing, though, just to give a feeling for it. But they said, and I'm quoting, the pattern of low inflation likely reflects sustained disinflationary forces, including technology, globalization, and perhaps demographic factors. Well, that stuff's difficult to fix. (laughs) So I'm not quite sure um, how they're going to generate the inflation they want. And it's not really too, too, too appropriate, really, at that point. So now we know there's a lot of weird stuff going on because of the pandemic. The negative yields is one thing. We talked about stocks. And here's an interesting one. And I did mention this last week. I've been watching the return to office a great deal just to see what's going on in the States as well as where I am. And what we've got here is we've got data from one of the companies that tracks uh, key swipes. There's a, a big company that does most of it in the States. And they've got data. And they know when people are going into the office. And they know when people are not going into the office. Why? Because you got to swipe your card to get into the office. And you can look at these metropolitan areas. My God, the average is 33.1 across 10 cities. And some of them, where was it? Uh, San Diego, I believe, Uh, Washington. There we go, San Jose. 24% is the occupancy rate. In other words, in San Jose and in these other areas, the majority of people are still not going to the office. They just aren't. And it's the same thing we're seeing over here in, in the UK, guys. Now, this is interesting. Because in the UK, we've got a big run up in property prices. Although I do have a property business and I've been telling people it's not that not that pronounced. I mean, some of the markets I'm operating in, I've seen weakness and, and some drops actually. But look at this. It turns out that in, in places like, like uh, London and things like that, we're actually seeing property prices drop or slow down in growth because they're trying to move out moving out to where we are in Essex and and other areas like that. They want bigger houses. They want gardens because they're going to be working from home for a long time. Uh, Over the weekend, it came out that the Bank of England is going to let staff work from home forever. And we can see in general that some of the government agencies, their, their service is very poor. It's taking excessive amounts of time to get anything done that relates to paper, for instance, a passport or tax ID, uh, uh, information, things like that, because nobody's in the office. Some 80% of government agency staff are working from home. 
and it'll be interesting to see how long this persists. I know a lot of people that are refusing to go back to the office. They're focusing on remote work. Uh, I can't wait to get back on campus, to, to be honest with you. I don't like sitting here. <laughs> It's like I'm a really active person, so I'm sort of going nuts just sitting here. Although I do deliver, you know, quality product for the students. But the point is, most people don't want to go back, or I should say a large number of people don't want to go back to the office. And consequently, we're seeing things happen in the UK that reflects demand for properties outside of London, outside of those areas. It's really interesting. Oh yeah, and you know, we talk about crypto every week because you know, I'm a fanatic, not a fanatic fan. I wouldn't call myself a fanboy. It's just, I buy Bitcoin every week. I've been doing so for years. And now the, the next thing that we're seeing after, after crypto is DeFi, decentralized finance. I'm very active in that space. And this came from one of my mailing lists, and we were talking about it as well. Look at the volume there. Wow. So now you can start to see we've got large institutional, institutional, professional, large retail, small retail. And this is the activity, the percentage of trading volume for each of these five cohorts. And presently, decentralized finance, the transaction volume is about 98% institutions really wild. And typically this is crypto, venture capital funds. I, I do know some of the uh, institutional investors in the States are starting to, to nibble and play around and, and learn about this new space. So it's really wild that this is going on. I'm, I'm very surprised about this, guys. And if you haven't gotten into DeFi, don't worry about it. I'm going to do a video and I'll help you understand that later on, okay? I'll, that'll come out in about a couple weeks. Now, this is a good one. Because as I've shared with you guys, I've got about 67% of my retirement money in gold. So I tend to watch what's going on with gold really closely. And we've got three different periods of interest. We had inflationary spikes in 2006, 2012. Guys, look at this. You can see with these other periods where we've seen gold respond. 2006, gold was up 24%. 2012, gold was up 27%. Now, gold is actually down. So I do tend to believe that gold, I don't see why people wouldn't hold gold. <laughs> uh, it's a little different than putting money into, for instance, Bitcoin. Bitcoin, of course, you've got no cost to hold it. With gold, you have negative yield. You've got a cost to, to, to hold it, uh, storage and insurance costs. But regardless, I don't really understand why people aren't putting money into to gold. It's a, an excellent time in my view. There's a lot of negatives going on presently in the global financial system. And I, I think you do need to have some security, the security that only metals can give you. All right, guys, that's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed it. And once again, looks like it's going to be a good week coming up. The U.S. is closed tomorrow. There's a holiday. See, I left the country and the work ethic went to pot. <laughs> Did really bad. But yeah, there's a, a holiday. So the U.S. market's going to be closed. But aside from that, I think everything's going to be sunny and shiny and good from going on for the rest. All right, take care, guys.